despite what you may have heard, God isn't obligated to give you what you want just because you ask with sincerity. It's vital that you know when you pray that you're praying for the right things. We consider that next on today's Grace to You. be surprised to learn that praying is not so much about talking to God as it is listening to Him, being sensitive to His will as revealed in the Scripture, and humbly affirming those truths. But how do you go about doing that? Uh, what are the steps to take and the steps to avoid? John MacArthur helps answer the questions on today's Grace to You in a practical study that he's titled Praying for the Right Things. Uh, today's lesson takes a look at the Apostle Paul's prayer life, how he prayed for the right things, and let's join John MacArthur for that lesson today. One of the most unusual legacies of World War II has been the cargo cults, as they're called in the South Pacific. Many of the Aboriginal island peoples, ranging all the way from Australia to as far north as Indonesia, were first exposed to modern civilization through the Allied Armed Forces during World War II. The American military in particular often used remote islands that had been inhabited only by local natives. They used those islands as temporary landing strips and supply depots. White men came to those islands bearing cargo, and they left as quickly as they had come. Tribal people had no time to learn the ways of civilization. Civilization just swooped down and dropped itself on them. They saw high technology up close. These planes would come out of the sky, land in the jungle, leave their payload, and then take off. Island natives saw cigarette lighters, and they saw them produce fire magically and thought they were miraculous. They saw large machinery push aside the forests to build the airstrips where these big planes could come in. For the first time, they saw jeeps and modern weapons and refrigerators and radios and power tools and many varieties of clothing and food. They were fascinated, really, by all of that, and the conclusion they made, somewhat naturally, was that the white men were gods. And they flew in out of the sky with all the stuff. And their conclusion was that gods were beings who brought you lots of stuff. When the war was over, the armies were gone, tribesmen built shrines to the cargo gods. Their tabernacles were perfect replicas of airplanes or control towers or hangars made out of bamboo or some kind of woven natural material. They looked like the real thing, but all they were good for was a place of worship. On some of the more remote islands, the cargo cults are still thriving today, right now, today. And if you go to some of those places, you will find that some of them have personified all Americans into one deity, and the name of that god is Tom Navy. They pray, the people do, for holy cargo to be dropped. And they venerate religious relics, such as Zippo lighters, cameras, eyeglasses, ballpoint pens, nuts and bolts, other assorted things. As civilization has begun to penetrate these remote islands where cargo cults exist, their fascination for cargo has not diminished. Missionaries who have been sent to those areas to preach the gospel find that the people involved in the cargo cults give them initially a warm reception because they think it's the second coming of the cargo gods. The problem is they're looking for the cargo, not the gospel. And missionaries find that they are so steeped in a materialism they don't even understand that they cannot easily receive the gospel. And it has become very difficult to penetrate these cargo cultic peoples with saving truth. Well, I look at that kind of strange, bizarre religious phenomena, and I see in contemporary Christianity quite an interesting parallel to that. These contemporary teachers teach, frankly, that prayer is a means for self-gratification. 
Prayer is a tool by which you get what you want. And primarily what you want is material. It is consumable. It is something you can hold in your hand. It is money. It is clothes. It is cars and houses and other material things. There is, in my mind, no difference between the strange, bizarre cargo cults of the South Pacific and contemporary prosperity preaching that reduces God to some kind of servant who, upon the whim and at the self-gratifying wish of anyone associated with him, must dump the cargo. That's prevalent today. There is such a gross misunderstanding as a result of that of what prayer is all about that it needs to be corrected. Now that takes me to the passage before us. Open your Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 takes us into the prayer life of Paul. His prayer life is absolutely unlike the approach to God that I have just described. Paul doesn't pray for material things. He doesn't pray for consumable things. His prayers are much deeper than that. Listen to how he prays, 2 Thessalonians 1.11. To this end also we pray for you. And we pray always that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power in order that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in Him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing material in that prayer. There's nothing consumable in that prayer. There's nothing self-gratifying about that prayer. The God to whom Paul prays is no cargo God. He doesn't bring radios and cameras and TVs and binoculars and Zippo lighters that's not what Paul prays for. Paul has understood prayer for what it really is on the deep level that God intended it to be. True prayer is learning to think God's thoughts after Him, learning to desire God's desires with Him, learning to love what He loves and hate what He hates. And the deeper your prayer life becomes, and the more it